The World Cup is a very important event that takes place every two years. For some of the top players in the world, it's their only way to reach the World Championship title. You know, if you finish top two in the World Cup, you make it to the candidates. If you win the candidates, you get the right to challenge the world champion, Magnus Carlsen in this case. And if you beat Magnus Carlsen, then you become the world champion. Because other modes of qualification like say FIDE Grand Prix or having the highest rating in the world, all of this is sometimes not possible for a player like Vitugo, who is the person whom we are going to discuss in this video. He is 2732, one of the top GMs in the world, has consistently been in top 30 and uh, has won Gibraltar Masters in the past. Uh, also recently he won the Prague Masters. He is uh, usually finishing in the top in the Russian Super League. Uh, Super, uh, League. So overall uh, a fine player. But he hardly gets invitations to super tournaments like say Vaikan Zay or Singfield Cup or Shamkir and all of these. So when he faces opponents like uh, Karyakin or Wesley So, like he did in this World Cup, it's always interesting because he's strong and these players are world class and the battle between them is always nice. Let me show you the tweet that Vitugo made after he got knocked out in round 5. So this is how it looked. Uh, he said, this tournament is like life. Eventually, it has a sad end. Lucky guys leave it quickly. Stubborn one, ones who fight on their limits, sometimes painfully. But what happened here also matters. And I'm proud of the level of chess I have shown in the tournament, but not today. And you can see him extremely dejected sitting there. This was after his loss to Yu Yangi in the fifth round. It went all the way up till the Armageddon and he lost that game. So we'll come to this moment and this game soon. But first, his two excellent victories. I have been analyzing his two games since morning today. Uh, spent nearly four to five hours. Uh, first of all, his win against Karyakin and then against Wesley. So you're going to see both of them and I'm going to pose you with questions so be ready and let's get it started so in the first game against karyakin this was in round three with you go opened with e4 and we had the roy lopez on the board after bishop b5 knight f6 d3 bishop c5 so this is the anti berlin and now he took on c6 dc6 and as you can see Taking on e5 is not possible because of queen d4 attacking the knight and also the f2 pawn. So knight bd2 castles, still the same problem, you can't take on e5. And now after queen e2, when you defend the f2 point, now this pawn is hanging. So black plays the move knight to d7. Knight c4, rook e8 and now bishop d2. So white is being very flexible. He doesn't know where he will take his king, maybe on king side or maybe on queen side. We'll see as how as the game progresses. B5 was played by Sergei and knight went back to e3. Here came knight f8 and now you can see this knight wants to go to e6 to f4 or d4, these two squares. And so white began with a very typical move in this variation, which was the move h4. And this is an interesting move because now you sort of give up your right of short castling, at least for the time being, you don't want to put your king on g1. But you are looking at ideas like h5, h6, and you're trying to just push this h pawn and see what happens. You're feeling black's king side. So black played the move a5, which is logical. He sees that if white king is not going on the king side, it will go to the queen side. So let me start pushing my pawns. And here normally white players have castle long, but Vitugo played a very interesting move. I want you to take some time and try to think what would you do here as white. So nothing spectacular, but it's sort of a new concept. He played the move a4. And it's a little surprising because on one side you played your pawn to h4, then on the other side you played a4. So you have made 
both these moves and now your king can't go on the either side. But your threat is very clear, you want to take and then the a5 pawn is hanging. And if you play b4 here, then knight can jump to c4. And this position, well, is still complicated, but at least white got the c4 square. Uh, in fact, this could have been played and later on, you know, after you defend with f6, you can go bishop e6 and take this knight. But with you, uh, Karyakin said, no, let me just play bishop b6 and ask white what he wants to do. But you go said, I want to push my pawn. I want to push it all the way to h6. And here I feel it should have, uh, Karyakin should have played h6 and stopped the pawn. But uh, black has a powerful, uh, white has a powerful move here. So take a minute or so and try to think what would you do here. Okay, when your opponent plays a move like h6, always remember it's like a hook. You can push the pawn besides that file and try to open up lines. So the right move here would be g4. Well done if you found this move. And not being afraid that you're giving up a pawn after bishop e3, queen e3, bg4, because after rook g1 takes takes, this is excellent compensation for white. He's threatening to take here. He can long castle and bring his other rook. Queen can come to f5. So overall, white is doing really well here. But to h5, Sergei played knight to e6. And here, Vitugo made a prof prophylactic move and played his queen to d1. Now, knight f4 can be met with g3. Queen is no longer attacked. So, knight came to d4. And Vitugo pushed in h6, g6. And now, knight takes d4. So, my question to you is, how would you recapture on d4? Well, I hope you did better than Karyakin because he got this completely wrong. He took it with the e pawn and uh, sorry, he took it with the queen, but I feel he should have taken with the e pawn here uh, because the knight doesn't really have a very good square to go to. If you go to g4, f5 is very strong and yes, you can go knight f1, but it's sort of passive and yeah, f5 is not the best idea here. Because knight g3 followed by f3 and you have good control in the center. But after knight f1, black can just develop his piece, say bd7 or even this move c5 here with the idea of c4. Looks pretty interesting. This is what he should have done. Also bd4 might have been okay here, but uh, you know the a5 pawn is slightly weak. So he took queen d4. He thought he's attacking this pawn on b2 perhaps, but now you see the power of uh, the pawn on h6. White took a, b, c, b and now queen to f3, threatening to come to f6 and now there could be a mate on g7. So you can't take this queen f6 takes. This is a very interesting line. You sacrifice both your rooks, but got a checkmate. So, somewhat like the immortal game. So queen d8 and now knight jumped to d5. Knight f6 is a threat, so f5 was played and now knight took cb, ef5, bishop f5. <coughs> and Vityugo uh, continued playing very interesting chess. He went queen to b7. He could have just castled here, which is also fine. But he said, okay, I'm threatening a mate now on g7. So black played rook e7 and now came queen to c6. So as black, what would you do here? That's my question to you. All the people who thought about the move e4 here, well done. This is not the best move in the position, but at least you're thinking in the right direction. You're thinking that the position should be opened up and this is very good. But the execution is bad because e4 is met with, yes, short castles, not bishop g5. This is a blunder because now ed3 check. And if you take on e7, queen e7, king f1, rook c8, bishop e6, this is just lost position for white because after queen d3, bishop c4 loses the queen and overall, I'm taking dc2 and this is just better for 
black. So the right way to counter e4 is to short castle and then after ed3 now play bishop g5 and you can see because of the inversion in move order now there is no check and you know I have castled not king is not on f1 so it's a big difference. But uh, so e4 doesn't work bd7 was chosen by Karyakin check. And now rook e6 is forced. Well, this doesn't work because of bishop g5 now. So he played rook e6. And now after castles, if you assess this position carefully, you will realize that white has a strong pawn on h6. His bishop is better than black's bishop. And the king is weak on g8. And so is the pawn on e5. So all these factors combined give white a very very solid edge but look at how Vityugo builds his position now this is something to learn because he attacks the weaknesses really well queen e8 now rook a e1 bringing the rook bishop went to c6 and now queen came back queen f7 rook e3 doubling the rooks on e5 rook e8 and you get the other rook so black played rook e7 and now my question to you is would you take the queen on f7 or would you not do that? Well done if you didn't take the queen because this is the correct way to play. The king is slightly weak here. Your king is pretty safe. Keep the queens on the board. And Vitugo found a very nice idea. He played b3 and this is how he's going to place his pieces. He's going to put his bishop to c3. The rook will go to e2. The queen will come from a1 to e1 and all the pieces will attack on the e5 pawn which will give white a clear advantage. So b4 was played. So Karyakin says I won't let you attack with your bishop on c3 but never mind queen a1 now e5 is hanging so queen f6 and now this little move rook e2. I like how Vityugo places his pieces makes way for the queen also defends the f2 point bd5 and now the queen comes to e1 rook e6 and now the last part in the puzzle how do you put more pressure on e5 you are right bishop to c1 bishop is coming to b2 and queen h4 bishop b2 uh, the pawn here let's say if you take here then i take on e5 takes takes this is already much better for white this pawn was much more critical than h6 and this bishop on b2 becomes very strong so bishop c6 was played and here is a small trick what happens if white takes on e5 so can you tell what should black do yeah well it was tricky defense and when you are playing against the minister of defense sergey karyakin you always have to be alert. Bishop into g2, threatening a mate on h1. And if you take, then queen g4 is a perpetual and a draw. So you have to be careful of such tricks. Vitugo was, and he played rook to h3, queen g5, rook g3, and now the e5 pawn fell. Karyakin defended really well. The rooks go, uh, got exchanged here. Takes, takes. And we reach this end game and I feel it can be holdable but still very difficult because these pawns are really weak and also the bishop and queen will combine to create some attack against the black king. a4, bishop c5, queen d5 and now I like this uh, next move f3 of course stopping mate but the point is he is okay to give up this pawn on b3 but queen e5 can come now and you can see there is a check and check threatened here so black has to be careful. He went back, black is even a pawn up here but it doesn't matter with opposite colored bishops, the dark squares being weak, white is much better. Now threatening a mate, so king f8, check and I like how Vitugo repeats the position twice and then goes king to f2 asking black what's your next move because the the point was if you played queen c5 check here which was the obvious move then i go queen e7 and if you take here which is a blunder then i check 
check and it's not even a draw because I take this bishop with a check and black is winning. So that was Karyakin's trick. So Vityugo said I am going to play king f2 and now my threat is to give you a check and win this bishop. Well bd7 had to be played and then the game could go on like this when the material is even white has good chances of winning. Karyakin may have held on to it but he blundered and this is what a tough position does to you. It grinds you down and brings out the blunder. So queen d5 was played. And now Vityugo finished off the game with a winning move. What do you play here? Bishop to c5 check. Excellent move. And now if king f7, there is this mate. And if king to g8, then check. King f7 check. Did you see all the way up to mate? It was not very difficult. And this is a checkmate. So that's how. Vityugo beat one of the strongest players, uh, Sergei Karyakin, in the tournament and knocked him out. It was a win for him, then the second game was a draw, so one and, one and half half. And in round four, as he progressed, he then met Wesley So. Now, Wesley So, as you all uh, remember, beat Vidit Gujarati in round three. So he was, you know, he had two days of rest, and of course, he's an amazing player. So the game again with Hugo was white and he began with e4 and you know uh, Ding Liren and Grishchuk were asked in one of the interviews as to do you think if you get white in your first game it's an advantage or a disadvantage. Ding Liren said well if I get black in the first game I feel it's some kind of an advantage because it's like in football terms playing your away match first so that that is over then you have a home match in in the uh, next time. So similarly, if in, with black you are able to hold, then with white you will have an edge and you can put pressure on your opponent. But with Vityugo, it was like he got white pieces and uh, you know, Grishchuk said in that interview, if you are playing Vityugo, playing with black is dangerous because he just plays with white, beats the opponent <laughs> and the round is over. So here, uh, Wesley, he didn't play knight c6 like Karyakin. Uh, over here, he went for knight f6, which is the Petrov. And here, knight into e5 is the main move, but the second main move is d4, knight into e4, bd3, d5, knight takes e5, knight d7, knight c3. Okay, main line is to take, take, castles, bd6, c4, and this is how the main uh, stuff goes. But Okay, knight d7 uh, here, knight c3 was played by Vityugo. He didn't take on d7. Takes, takes, knight takes c3, he takes c3. And this is, I feel, uh, one of the most instructive positions in the game. And I want you to think for some time. Forget that Vityugo is white and he won the game and stuff like this. Try to think objectively who is better here and why. Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, reveal to you why I feel uh, what is the thing that is happening in this position. But if many of you who are watching this video felt that how to assess this position, I do not know, you know, uh, I'm not sure how to do it, then I would recommend you to go for this book, uh, Reassess Your Chess. Reassess Your Chess book, uh, which we have, because this book uh, deals with this theory of imbalances. And this is what I'm going to discuss over here. So if you look, this is the book I have with me. Uh, in case if anyone would like to have it, this is the book which you can find in the Chess Base India shop. And it deals with what we are going to discuss now. So imbalances is nothing but differences in a chess position. So if you look at the differences here, then you can find out what you have to do, what is the plan in the position and how you should go about it. Also you understand the assessment. Now first thing you notice is that white has double pawns and it looks ugly, you know, no one likes double pawns, at least I don't. Uh, black has a beautiful pawn structure, so I would say in that sense, black should be better, right? 
but when you have double pawns you get an advantage and that is an open file. So rook can come to b1 and gets this activity and secondly white has a pawn majority on the king side while black has a pawn majority on the queen side over here. So it's a battle of majorities and I think this is the key imbalance in the entire position. Now you have to understand who can make better use of their imbalances. Can black start rolling his pawns down the board which will be dangerous for white or can white start rolling the pawns down the board which will be dangerous for black. And in this particular case it feels as if for white to say castle and play f4 f5 is quite easy. For black on the other hand when he plays the move say c5 okay here this double pawns suddenly start to make a lot of sense because when you play d4 let's imagine I had this pawn on b2 over here then you play d4 you already get a passed pawn but here after d4 let's say I castle you play d4 just for the sake of argument I take take this is not a passed pawn I still have the c2 pawn in the picture. So this is what I want to explain that sometimes doubled pawns can be very good to restrain opponent's pawn majority. Now we will see how these things work out in the game. Bishop e7 was played by Wesley, castles by uh, with Hugo, castles and now you make use of your imbalance, you push your majority f4, threatening f5 and if I get in f6 nothing like it. So Wesley decided it's time to stop white's majority and he played the move f5. Now I would have really liked if f6 could be played because then I have pressure in the center. You don't really want to take because then your remaining pawns are not so potent anymore. But if here the problem was queen to h5 and you know there is this mating idea and now you have to anyway play f5 because g6 would be just met with bishop g6 with a mating attack. Check here, takes, takes and I can bring my rook up and this is going to be a mate. So f4 was met with f5 and now you must see how Vitugo plays this. He first plays the move bishop to e3, bishop e6. And how should you gain some more space in the position? What should white play? Good job if you found the move a4. Excellent move. This move gains more space on the queen side and it just feels like the right move. Right now no threats. It just restrains black pawns there. Queen d7, queen went to f3, rook fd8 and you play rook fd1. And now Wesley said well I have optimized my position. Let me push my pawn to c5, king h1, g6, h3, queen c7 and now comes my next question. How would you plan in this position? What would you like to do? Okay, usually you get plans by this imbalance method as I have mentioned and it's very important to pick out the weaknesses in your opponent's camp. Now here you will see that this pawn on uh, d5 is some kind of a small weakness. If I can build pressure on it, I'll get good play. So how do you build up the pressure? This bishop has to start attacking this pawn and it, the only way it can do is if you can get it to f3. So after queen f2, b6, queen e1, uh, I mean bishop e2 could have been played but first he went queen e1. Also I am not very pleased with the move b6 because it gives white a hook to play a5 at any point and open more lines as you will see in the game. Queen e1, king h8, bishop e1, uh, bishop e2, now bishop is coming here, rook g8, Wesley hopes that at some point he can play g5 but for now this move will be nothing but a weakening in the position. So bishop f3, rook a d8 and a5. So you can see how Vitugo is slowly and steadily putting pressure. Yeah, you don't really want to take this pawn because sooner or later this pawn will be rounded up in this manner and that a7 pawn remaining pawn would be a weakness. 
So B5 and what do you do now? Of course you want to isolate B5 and you play A6 and now you will see black has two weaknesses B5 and D5 and the C3 pawn restrains them wonderfully. Rook D7, Rook DB1, Rook B8, Bishop F2 just calmly improving the position Queen E2, Queen B6 and now how do you build more pressure on the position? Well done if you found the move Rook to B2. You see the idea is to get your Queen to B1 via F1 and Bishop to E2 to put more pressure on uh, B5. You don't want to play a Rook to B5 because then A6 pawn would be hanging in many lines. So Rook D7, Queen F1, Rook C7, Bishop E2 attacking B5, Bd7 and now Queen D5 attacking the D5 pawn and suddenly everything starts to rock. There is no way to defend with Rook coming to D8 this pawn and uh, Bishop E6 doesn't work because you lose this pawn. So the only way I think which would have been nice was Bishop C6 but somehow uh, Wesley thought it's not the right place for the bishop you are not blockading the passed pawn so he went queen e6 but this allowed the rook to come to a5 and look at this position this is a victory for white in terms of his middle game strategy each of his pieces is attacking black's pawn and they are in an active position while black's pieces are all passive king g7 queen a1 Okay, he could have taken on b5 immediately here, which was also fine. Uh, but then a6 would have been hanging. This is still slightly better for white. But he first went and defended a6. And now Wesley said, I'm losing b5 pawn. Let me get some activity. He played g5. But after bishop b5, rook b5 takes, bishop takes. Okay, queen a5 was good and strong move. But rook b5 is not at all bad because after gf, Queen a5, attacking the rook, queen into e5, rook b7, good move. You will see that although white is a pawn down, it's completely better and winning, almost winning. So the pawn on b7 is just one step away from queening. f3, and Vitugo finishes off the game really well. He's not afraid of any ghosts. He gets his king to the center where it is safe, picks up the a7 pawn. And here, uh, tactically alert, he remains tactically alert in this position because there will always be some chances like uh, here, white to play and win. I mean, he's already winning, but just to finish, yes, bishop takes c5, queen h2, you come back. And after h5, check. Queen f5. You see how he repeats his position in better positions. This is always showing dominance to your opponent. Check. Queen g4. And now, finally, how will you finish off the game? Well, excellent if you made a queen here because now after bishop b8, queen c5 check. It's either mate on b6 or b4. And Wesley resigned the game after b8 queen here. So two games I showed you against Karyakin and Wesley. So I hope you learnt a lot. And all this beautiful positional maneuvering, you know, against Karyakin, this move rookie 2, queen a1 that he got. And against Wesley, how he played this move, rook to beat first, you know, he, he got his bishop from um, here, from d3 to f3 and then later on he got it back again to e2 to attack the b5 pawn so simply high class play and he knocked out both these world class players who wanted to reach the candidates but now uh, looks difficult and because he was playing so well you know everyone's expectations from him was very high uh, and then came this game against yu yangi they were 4-4 in the match so it was a very close match between the two of them and Yu Yangi was white, it was an Armageddon. Yu Yangi had five minutes, uh, Niku, uh, uh, Nikita Vitugo had four minutes, and if he drew, then he would have qualified. And imagine what happened. Uh, 
uh, after just eight or nine moves over here, knight h4, Vitugo played, and then Yu Yangi blundered with bishop e4. You see what's going wrong, yes? Uh, the g2 pawn fell, f4 pawn fell, and you know, he should just convert this. But as things happened, somehow, I think there are many ways to win something like knight d4, knight d4, even queen c5, this should be good or some other way it should have been working out. But knight c5, even this two pawns up and well, what happened here was really bad because white got all the activity, his knight was dominating the board. And the extra pawn of black didn't really count anymore. Um, and it was a blitz, so of course mistakes are bound to happen. And here, rook c8 was played, and I want you to find the way to finish off the game. Many ways to do it, but Yu Yangi found the prettiest one. Rook g8 check takes and wins the game. So he's a rook up, and in the end, he resigned. And now you understand this tweet which we had shown, uh, which was with Hugo sitting on the board, extremely sad after this loss. And he wrote this quote, uh, two excellent games against Karyakin and Wesley So, and then fighting really hard against Yu Yangi, getting these two extra pawns, almost closing in on victory, and then you get knocked out. And if he would have won, he was just one step away from candidates. Should have been such a big breakthrough in his career. Well, that's how chess is. It's really brutal. But we must congratulate uh, with Hugo for playing such excellent chess. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. It was a little long video, but there were so many things to discuss and talk about that I hope you found it useful. Uh, if you like to see the PGN of this game, then I have the link of the article on Chess Base India below. And if you want to go for this book, Reassess Your Chess to Learn the Art of Imbalances, I have that link as well in the video. Good luck and see you soon. Bye.